Oh, hey there, darlings. So, I've got another new kit from the uh, company I so affectionately refer to as One Chip here. Um, here is, uh, here's what you get. Uh, so interestingly, there appears to be a stray component trapped in the bag. Hopefully that didn't fall off the board. Let me go ahead and set that aside. Uh, now these kits are not solderless, but uh, they do require two wires. I have no idea why this one came with 30, but um, not literally 30. But here is what we get. We get the uh, screen assembly already joined to the PCB. It's kind of bonded to this thing, so unfortunately if the screen itself breaks, you're going to have a a little bit of a wild time replacing it without replacing this PCB. Uh, but theoretically it is possible because this is just a DSi uh, upper LCD. Uh, one thing to note though is that they have desoldered the backlight ribbon cable from the normal ribbon up here and attached it directly to the board instead of running through this connector for whatever reason. I guess it made it easier on them. Uh, you'd see Normally it's attached right about there, but they soldered it right down there. Uh, but anyway, I guess they saw the wild success of the funny playing kit and decided, hey, we can do that too. And we can add our own spin on things. Except that this company usually makes kits that are only like 80% of the way there and then they mess up that last 20% uh, that leaves you, leaves you wanting more, I guess. Um, so let's see if they did that again, um, or if we have an actual hit on our hands. So let me get this sorted. I have three short wires and what was that, five long wires. Uh, the kit does come with a few touch sensors, quote unquote, already attached. These are just capacitance uh, sensors, so they're literally a wire soldered to a piece of copper tape and all it does is sense the change in capacitance when you stick one of your uh, meat bags near it. Um, let me give this a quick once over. I don't think it's missing any parts, but like I said, there was one in the bag, so let's just play it safe. Um, and actually, yes, indeed, it is missing a part. Uh, now, this certainly shouldn't happen to you, um, but unfortunately it did happen to me. Uh, I, in normal circumstances, I would have to return this kit and get another one. It's entirely possible that it works perfectly fine without this diode that fell off, but I'd rather not take the chance. So if you bear with me just a moment, I'm going to go ahead and reattach that. Uh, but before I do, this is what you get. You get the screen assembly. Two ribbons, one for either a 32 pin or a 40 pin, and this adapter cable, uh, and probably two wires. Uh, now I've seen the uh, some of the listings for this, and some of them include uh, some like extra insulation film, but it's really not too necessary. Uh, but anyway, let me go ahead and pause for just a moment. Let me get this component reattached where it needs to go, and we'll pick up where I leave off. All right, so again, in normal circumstances, this is something you would, should return the kit over, uh, but in my case, I'm capable of fixing it, and returning this kit would mean delaying this video by at least another week. Um, anyway, not, not too big a deal. It was just a diode, easy enough to reattach. The board is marked with the polarity, and so is the diode. So here we go. The ribbon comes out not attached because you have to attach another ribbon cable under it first, but which one you attach depends on which specific um, Game Boy you're plugging it into. So in my case, I'm not going to be using the 40 pin cable, but I will be using the uh, 32 pin cable and I will have to double check the orientation. Um, I don't know if it's pins up or pins down, but we'll figure it out. It's okay. Uh, otherwise, it should be pretty straightforward. 
Uh, so we've got the FPGA doing the signal conversion, so GBA signal comes in, gets fed into that, and then it feeds into this chip, which appears to be the HDMI encoder, given that it has the differential traces out to the HDMI port. Uh, and there shouldn't be any button controls that I know of. Uh, it looks like they included solder pads for them, but I don't know what is what, and previously when they've done this, they've included solder pads without actually programming in the functionality. Uh, so I'm just going to take their word on it and assume they don't work. Uh, maybe in the future that'll be different, but on the left here we have these two solder pads. These are for audio. And of course it's unlabeled. I don't know which is which. So if you find yourself getting uh, your left channel on the right audio and uh, or your left yeah if you get your left and right reversed uh, just swap these two wires I don't know which is which the um, documentation isn't very helpful and it's not labeled so we'll have to wing it but I think it'll be all right all right so let us get into things. I am going to go ahead and plug this adapter in so I don't forget it. Uh, it does come with one of these. It is just a micro HDMI to a full size HDMI. Uh, so in my case, I'm just plugging this straight into my uh, capture card, which I already ran an HDMI cable for. And we'll circle back to that in a bit. Anyway, tonight's donor is definitely not something that I just ripped out of a build that I've already done. Let us go ahead and do some baseline power measurements so that uh, so we can know what kind of damage this kit is going to do to our batteries. Uh, and so for the baseline, I just have a totally unmodified Game Boy Advance with the stock screen and my Pokemon Emerald game plugged in. Uh, same test I usually do. Power supply is running at 2.4 volts, and all we're doing is seeing exactly how many milliamps this thing pulls in the uh, same place. I always check it with the exact same cart that I always check with in the exact same conditions that I always check with. I'm going to try and not keep my uh, hand on the power switch. In fact, I'll just set that down there. So at 2.4 volts, the B4 is... Uh, looks like 87 milliamps or 86 milliamps to 91 milliamps, which is pretty much average. Um, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Basically, every GBA or GB console is going to be different. You can clean your power switch, and usually that's good for a few milliamps, uh, especially if you get a red power light on, um, or like it, it'll flicker if you touch it, like kind of like that. This thing could probably use it a clean, but it's good enough. I'm not going to worry about it. Um, it's consistent enough. So I think it should be fine, but just for your, your use case. And for context, 5 milliamps over the course of the whole battery life that you would expect with this thing, it's probably going to be like 10 minutes, like realistically. There are so many other factors involved that it's not going to give you any noticeable battery life, but it will give you a more reliable power indicator, at the very least. Anyway, at least tasty date. So first thing we want to do, we want to test the kit, make sure it's working before we go ahead and do the install. Uh, this thing is basically mine now since I've already soldered to it anyway. So whether it works or not, I'm stuck with it. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and plug in the 32 pin cable. Uh, it does matter which side goes in. One side is 30 pin, so don't put the 30 pin in the 32 pin. But pins up on the GBA side. And then this thing attaches. Oops. Pins down if we can. And set that down. Realistically, I should unplug this so I don't have to hold it while I'm plugging everything in. But, yeah. At the very least, I'll turn the power supply off. That in 
there. Flip that over. And then I've got just about nothing insulating it, so I am going to go ahead and hold it uh, just in case, because I don't want something to slip around while I'm handling it and short out on like the cartridge bus or something. Probably wouldn't be good. Plug in the same game. And hey, it kind of works. Oh, that's their color filters, yay. Okay. Let me get that in game there. And in the exact same place it usually is, same everything, uh, but with the backlight kit, we are pulling at 2.4 volts, 288 to 290 to 303 milliamps. Uh, but keep in mind, this does have adjustable brightness. So we have, at the bare minimum, 245 to 235 milliamps. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 brightness levels. Yeah, okay. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And on max brightness, this thing is pulling 366 to 376 milliamps, which is pretty high, uh, but not nearly as high as some of the other kits I've looked at lately. Um, oop, I accidentally hit the touch sensor. Wonderful thing about touch sensors. But it is what it is. Uh, there are not any extra features such as like pixel grid emulation because this is using a Nintendo DSi screen. Uh, it is running. It is running. It is running at uh, one times or like one x integer scale, and then pillar box and letter box because the DSi screen is a little bit higher resolution than the actual GBA screen. Uh, but it gives you that nice uh, quote-unquote authentic look. Um, really, it looks more like an AGS-101, which isn't quite authentic as far as uh, Game Boy Advance games are concerned, uh, because a lot of them are going to be designed with color palettes that suit the original screen a little bit better uh, and these things are notoriously dark not even taking in mind the fact that they don't have any internal lighting uh, so as a result some games will look pretty washed out but uh, these kits don't have any compensation for that one of the kits I recently took a look at does but unfortunately there were so many other things wrong with it that it's basically not even worth considering but anyway we know the kits working uh, the only thing we haven't tested yet is HDMI, but I'm going to wait until I have this thing assembled to test that. Um, just because it's going to be a little bit awkward trying to, to fiddle around with it while I'm just like holding everything in my hand. Uh, but also because I don't have OBS recording yet. Um, so let us carry on and try out the actual install here. So, like Funny Playing, they are using a DSi screen. Unlike Funny Playing, they're using the upper screen instead of the lower screen. Realistically, it shouldn't make any difference in terms of uh, quality or performance, uh, but unfortunately, it might make things a little bit different in terms of fit. Uh, now, the screens physically should be the same. The only difference should be the ribbon attached to the screen and the connector on the screen itself because on DSIs you have these extra little pads here that the speakers attach to and it's just a pass through on the ribbon uh, which means the ribbon is three or four uh, pins wider than the uh, lower screen but other than that they should be uh, like direct one-to-one -one swap and oh I guess it's not um, it's not attached that sturdy so if you need to replace it not too big a deal, I guess. But anyway, let's carry on with the install. Tonight's shell donor is going to be um, 
an insanely creative choice that you've never seen me do on this channel before. A color scheme I have absolutely never done with any other Game Boy ever. Whoop. I just knocked one of my lights off my desk. Let's fix that. Alright. It is a clear shell. But in this particular case, we are using one of the funny playing shells because these are already designed for uh, taking a screen this size. And so hopefully it will make our um, modifications a little bit easier. Pop that in there. And so with the funny playing kit, you get a uh, screen that looks something like this. Uh, again, just a regular DSi screen, but this one is the lower screen and thus has the different connectors, like I said. Uh, but they should be same physical size and basically the same performance. Uh, but one of the things Funny Playing does is they remove that front frame on the LCD that this one comes with installed. Uh, now I notice the instructions point out this metal frame and then say, nothing about it they just have an arrow pointing to it, it says metal frame it's fantastic um, on the funny playing side you are intended to trim these little white tabs to get it to fit into the shell and you are supposed to trim off some of these tabs here uh, to get everything nice and seated uh, but let us see what we have to do for this kit right so on the uh, funny playing kit for this shell, the shell that Funny Playing makes for their kit, we would trim this tab and this tab, and then we would just be able to drop their screen in. Uh, but in this case, we might need to do a little bit more than that. Um, and based off of how this is fitting in there, I'm thinking that is gonna be true now more than ever. In fact, it looks like we might have to just trim all of the tabs. Alright. Snip that one off. Snip that one off. And snip that one off. I'm surprised. I didn't think this was a uh, physically larger screen, but... I guess it is a little bit wider. Maybe that's that frame. You see on the right there, all that extra? Have them lined up on the left. So I guess that's why we got to trim that extra tab, but the room's there. Um, unfortunately, that is not the end of what we have to cut, though. Uh, we will have to file this out and get the um, get a hole cut for the port, and I'm gonna have to cut down by the power switch to make sure that this thing fits. Uh, for the power switch though, we can, we can do this real easily. I am just gonna come in here, mark that, rather score it. And then if I come back, ah, I'm gonna do it with the Dremel. It's a clear shell. I don't wanna mar it up. Unfortunately, the, uh, oh, I thought this was the leaky one, the uh, flush cutters will leave some stress marks, but i got to cut that up. That's okay. I'll set this aside. We're not using it. probably clean that up first so I can do some test fits. Uh, one moment while I go trim that. Alright, just a quick little cut. Get the uh, swarf out of there.
a Dremel or other rotary tool on a drill press stand. Highly useful for stuff like this. Makes super clean, super precise cuts. I uh, get a lot of control out of it. But anyway, now we can drop the bottom in. And you can see the only part we're having uh, fitment issues on now is where the uh, port's going to sit. We can slide that up. You see it's sitting in the uh, cavity nicely. It's just the port itself that does not fit. So now... Oh, they did it again. Those sons of guns. They made the PCB bit a little bit wider and stick out a little bit too far. So you have to trim to account for the PCB and not just the port. But uh, we'll make it work. In this case, I am going to mark up. The inner boundary with my skirple. And then if we scroll through the pictures of the completed mod, uh, you can see how horrifying they cut this thing. Uh, but it looks like it only goes down to about here-ish. Uh, so that's where I'll stop and then we'll do a little bit of a guess and check, I guess. Uh, so let me go ahead and get that trimmed up as well. Um, again, this is going to require a lot of eyeballing because there's no like jig or anything for this, uh, but we'll make it work. We'll be right back again. And if you don't have a rotary tool and a drill press stand, and you don't want to get one for one specific thing, which I don't blame you, and you shouldn't. Um, a needle file set is going to be the way to go to do this. All right, so based off the fact that the screen is sitting almost flush against the front shell, uh, I'd say I got my cuts pretty darn spot on, um, which is weird. I almost never get them first try, but here we are, I guess. Let us clean up those edges a little bit. That swore out of there. They make tools specifically for this. One day, I should get one. Until then, the knife it is. Right too. So this thing does not come with any adhesive that I know of. Um, I guess they intend for you to just jam it in there and hope for the best and realistically, I mean, it's not going to go anywhere. Getting the alignment wrong is going to be pretty difficult because of how freakishly huge this screen is. Uh, but so far, uh, it seems like the funny playing ITA ready screen is the way to go. Let's see if that or uh, shell. Let's see if that holds up. Uh, we will have to trim the back a little bit too. Uh, but now that we have everything fitting, I guess let's go ahead and get the sensors installed. So they intend for you to jam one uh, right up in the front housing right here. But before we do that, I suppose let's put a lens on this bad boy uh, and peel that off so that I don't have to keep repeating actions. And uh, I probably need some buttons, don't I? Let me go grab some of those. Alright, I'm not sure how well this color scheme is going to work out, but we're going to try it. So I've got one of the brand new lenses from Funny Playing here uh, because. 
but also I'm gonna get gonna get the chance to use it. Um, one of the things they've been playing with, and I, I'm not sure how I feel about. It. I checked out one of their earlier samples, uh, but they're trying. They're playing with this uh, two and a half D. It's called glass, where the edges are like rounded off. You can sort of see that as the light hits the edge, uh, the reflection from my light rather. You can see how it. Uh, uh, there's like a little bit of a bezel, and then as I turn the lens, the light works its way around that bezel. It's pretty neat looking, uh, but one of the things that I didn't like about the design was that um, on, an, on a shell that isn't really designed for one of these lenses, the uh, inset is uh well the, the bezel is inset and it just kind of looks like a, a weird gap um, but let's see if there's been any improvement to that also i highly recommend if you're using a shell from a manufacturer that also makes lenses use their lens too because this shape of the lens is surprisingly complicated and every single aftermarket that I've seen uh, manufacture of these things uses a slightly different shape so they don't always fit nice and clean. Peel that off. Despite the appearance of the film it is actually clean under there. At least in my case. And we drop that in. You can use some double-sided tape or a sticky gasket or something to hold things in place and maybe hopefully prevent some dust from getting in there, but I think we're gonna be fine. Oop. Though I suppose it would be nice to hold things in place so that that doesn't happen multiple times over. So highly recommend not doing this in the shell, but here we are. Let us get the two wires for audio attached up. I wish they didn't have the solder pads over the screen. Like I, I know it's there's almost no way to do that and have the board pre-attached. Um, without putting it on like the ribbon or something, but this is a good way to cook your screen. So you have to be in and out real quick, real careful. Get those tinned. Drop one in. I mean, realistically, they should have just had you use the pads on the screen that already exist. But, like I said, this uh, kit maker is famous for, famous for getting you 80% of the way there and uh, leaving you hanging on that last 20%. That is not a great joint. I'm not having a good time, and I can't put flux on that either. because it'll leak into the screen, and we don't want that. There we go. It especially doesn't help the chances for your screen when you do stuff like that, where you have to go back and hit it an another few times. Oh, before finishing that, let's do this. I'm going to use two both touch sensors, even though I will almost never use that palette one. Uh, I want to make sure it doesn't actually do anything I don't know about. Jam that right in there. I'm going to use the plastic spudger so I don't poke holes in it. And I'm just getting it pressed down nice and flat because, you know, transparent. You'll see it.
And in this particular case, I think we want to cut a little bit of a notch in the plastic so the wire has some place to sit. I'm just gonna come in here. Flush cutters, take a small chunk out one direction. On the other side, take another chunk out, make a little bit of a V cut. Because you won't see this, but it's the easiest way to do that, and it makes more than enough room. Just like that. And then I'm going to route this around the wires I just soldered. Do we want to put this? The instructions say throw it right on the bottom, but I hate routing it over all of this uh, circuitry because, like I said, it's a capacitance sensor and, well, you can get false positives. But Plus, with how I grab these things, I will trigger this. And then, it will trigger me. But we'll try it, and if I hate it, I'll move it. And if we flip it over, not the best positioning, but functional. Roll it. And that'll be nice and out of the way. Okay. I am also using funny playing buttons. This is a, almost a, and funny playing membranes. Uh, this is basically a pure funny playing build except I'm not using their backlight kit. But they make everything else and I'm really pleased with the quality of their buttons, membranes, shells, backlight kits even. Um, am I missing? No, okay. And right about now is the time I say, hey, don't forget your light pipe. Now we need to solder these two wires to SO1 and SO2. The test pads are right above the uh, B button here. Go ahead and get that tuned. And like I said, I have no idea which one's which, so if the audio is backwards, um, I guess just swap yours. I could put some more effort into wire routing, but I don't think I'm going to. On this side, though, I can use flux to clean up my nasty joints. the other. And if all went well, we should be done with the soldering. Just going to tuck those wires under there. should be smooth sailing from here on out, hopefully. Yeah, we'll get there, okay.
If you're using a funny playing shell, use the screws that come with the kit, not your original ones. The um, longer screws especially are slightly shorter than OEM because the screw posts are slightly shorter than OEM. So if you use your OEM screws, uh, you could get some uh, screw nipples on the front. You don't want that. really happy with that fit but it's what we got to work with so all right let's do a test fit so yeah I'm gonna have to trim a little bit on the bottom shell as well but should fit everywhere else aside from right where that port is so I'm gonna go ahead and mark that off again I'm just marking the inner constraints and then I plan on cutting through my scurple marks here uh, and we want to cut that length whatever that is um, I'm just gonna wing it again because there is no cleaning up that top hole so I can't even mark it off there it is I need to buy a new scurples Sharpie, not Skirple. I could buy Skirple. Anyway, let me go cut this. I'll be right back. Alright, so I already see a problem. I did not cut the front low enough. As you can see, the port is not sitting where it needs to, so I need to come back and cut a little bit more. Uh, so I am going to do quite a bit more trimming, and I will be back once um, things are sorted. Alright. I think we're almost there. I cut too deep, unfortunately. Maybe I'll make a uh, custom like 3D printed bezel to hide that. Uh, if this thing is halfway decent, I'll put in the effort, but... Yeah... Um... Yeah, we'll get there. I need to trim a little bit more on the bottom shell so that it actually fits around that port. Alright, here we go. Now we can finish the reassembly. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Oh. I'm gonna have to trim the power switch. Yep. Because, of course, we do. So I'm just gonna try, see if I can trim. I probably just cut entirely too much off, but. Well, at least it works this time. Hey, and now it fits. Here is what my power switch looks like now. A big chunk cut out of it. I cut a little bit too far. Um, less is more, you can always remove more material, but you can never add it back once it's cut off. But. Oh well. Let's throw a new power switch in here. Is this even the right size bit? 
That appears to be. While you guys weren't watching, I uh, pulled a sneaky on you. I decided to uh, fully commit to this install and I used a little bit of adhesive on the screen. Uh, I already regret it because I did not clean well enough and it was immediately obvious as soon as I put it together that I did not clean well enough so at some point the screen's gonna have to come out or the lens is gonna have to come off to get some dust out of there or I can just ignore it and uh, pretend it doesn't exist but oh well it is what it is it was bound to happen right it would have been the cleanest install had I not used any adhesive So it's just plastic threading into, or metal threading into plastic. We do not need to over tighten it. Uh, snug is good, and then back an eighth a turn is my usual method snug, and then back. Snug, and then back. Come on. Snug and then back. Snug and then back. Snug and then back. And then back. And one more. I don't know why I would do that in that order. Everything feels seated and proper. I guess let's uh, go ahead and try it out. Let me take a minute, get this cleaned up, get the uh, OBS capture going, and uh, be right back. All right, let's try it out, shall we? Get some batteries in this bad boy. Uh, so I did make sure my capture setup works. I did capture some footage from the previous iteration of this thing. Uh, the previous iteration wasn't exactly a kit. It was just a um, it was a board that sat between the, whatever screen you wanted to install and the board itself and then provided some HDMI output. One of the nice things, if you can say that, uh, about that old kit is it fit quite a bit better than uh, this one does. Uh, it was a lot easier to trim for because they didn't have that little bit of PCB sticking out. I don't know why they insist on doing that, but here we are. Anyway, let's go ahead and get some normal batteries in here. As you can hear, the Game Boy came right on. At the very least, the alignment is spot on, so thank goodness for that, because if it was off... Um, that would have sucked, because there does not appear to be any way to adjust it, unlike on the Funny Plane Kit. Uh, so let's try this out. Let's get some flash carts here. First thing, I am going to try the AGS Aging ROM, uh, because we want to check and see if the LCD comes calibrated out of the box. So. Uh, if we pull up the AGS Aging ROM, which is linked in the description, I have a, um, a website that I've set up that has links to all the handy stuff that I use, my socials, etc. Uh, but there's the AGS Aging ROM in there, and if we load up the Flickr test, uh, this first test pattern on an uncalibrated screen would produce a flickering image. Uh, since I don't see any flickering, I think it's decently calibrated 
seems good enough. So move on to the next test. Next, let us try whatever this is. I think this is 240p test suite. Uh, we'll probably have to circle back. Yeah, let's circle back to that. I want to try this one on the HDMI out more than anything else because uh, we want to test a few different things. I think this is also 240p test suite because of course I would have two with the same ROM in my test bag. Oh, this is not 240p test suite. Oh, I flashed the reader to this. Oop. I was playing with it. Totally unrelated. Let's try... Screw it, let's just jump into the EverDrive. And by EverDrive, I mean Easy Flash. Even though the EverDrive has all the same ROMs on it. Uh, firmware update. Oh, 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 oh. Let's try aging one more time. Because I'm thinking something's messed up by the fact that that went into firmware update. I'm thinking I have a shoulder button problem. Go into the key input. Oh, no, I don't. I don't know why that came up. All my buttons are working normal. Just kidding, maybe I was holding it on startup. Yeah, that was weird. Okay, never mind, disregard. Uh, what do we want to test here? No. I should have grabbed the Game Boy one, not the Game Boy Advance one. The Game Boy one is right no. Going to try EverDrive that I have in my custom housing with my custom label because of who I am as a person. Because the stress tests for Game Boy tend to work a little bit better than the Game Boy Advance ones. Um, GB test rums. Let's try the scrolling bars test. If you've heard me say this before, you've heard me say it a thousand times, but as this pattern moves across the screen, we can test, we can observe uh, the behavior and see if there is any screen tearing or frame dropping. It should be perfectly smooth, except for when the S in the word scrolling hits the left hand side of the screen. That is when the kit issues an LCD reset command. Uh, we test this specifically because older kits handled LCD resets really poorly, and realistically it hasn't been a problem in a while, but you know, the older kits would like drop frames, you know, up to 60 frames, which means you're losing a second, a whole second of gameplay, and in games like Pokemon Pinball, that would make it unplayable, because every time the ball crosses the threshold of the, of the screen, you know, when you're swapping from the top half to the bottom half, it would issue a reset. If you're losing a second every time you do that, you know, a second, it it takes less than a second for the ball to travel down from the top to the bottom, so you could lose your ball. Um, but like I said, realistically, that hasn't been a problem in a long time, and I see zero issues here. Let's go back to the menu. The other one we want to test is Link's Awakening, perhaps. And I have the oopsie doodle. Just trying to wipe something off the screen. Um, I can test this with the uh, 240p test suite, but I like testing it with Zelda, uh, Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, because we get two different things here. So first thing, you can look at this guy's chain, and again, set it before, deal with it. Um, but the original Game Boy console had no way of making transparent sprites, so a lot of devs would work around the issue by flickering the sprite on and off as quickly as they could, and because of the horrid pixel response of the original screens, you'd get a nice, even transparency effect. Um, one of the nice 
things, if you can call it that, about the DSi screens in particular is that they don't really have a good pixel response either. So they emulate that look by just being terrible screens, I guess? Um, and that's not entirely fair, but it is what it is. Um, for a Game Boy, it ends up working out pretty darn nicely. Um, I've seen one kit do this recently, and the Analog Pocket, where it gives you the best of both worlds. It's literally just an option. You can turn on that uh, smearing, that frame blending, um, and it gives you the desired effect. No more flickering, everything works out nicely. But unfortunately, in higher paced action games, uh, there's just more blurring. Like if you're playing Mario, you, you see the blurring as you're running through the levels. But in this particular case, I guess if it performs more accurate to how the original Game Boy performed, that's ideal. Um, but not all games use this trick, so it doesn't make sense to gimp all of your games for some of them, if, if, you, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. Uh, so on that note, what I'm trying to say is I generally prefer the higher pixel response of the older 9380 kits. Uh, so, if you've seen what I've got in my slates here, these are the 9380 kits. I generally prefer the look and performance of these screens a little bit better, uh, but this is technically more accurate, and, uh, ooh, knock that over. And I know a lot of people prefer this, but it is genuinely personal preference. Um, as long as you're not playing a game that has transparency. Um, but yeah, I see no problems here. The other thing we wanted to check is uh, if I change the screens back and forth quite rapidly, you can see the kind of smearing, or maybe not, because I don't know how much the camera's actually picking up. Uh, but on some of the older kits, um, switching from brown to green color, that is these logs in the grass, would uh, cause some of the pixels to overshoot their color values, and that would result in some kind of smearing of some of the art of some of the objects across the screen. This thing's performing perfectly fine. I don't see any issues with it. All right, one more. The blaster is the 240p test suite. So now let us do the transparency one more time. I want the shadow sprite, and this is that exact same thing I was just testing with the chain. Uh, in an ideal world, we would see no flickering, and this object is transparent um, because it is just a solid black square that is flickering on and then flickering off very quickly. And so, like I said, in an ideal world, there would be no flickering, it would just be a gray square. Uh, some of the other backlight kits have I don't want to call it a burn-in because that sets the wrong expectation. It's not burn-in, but they do have some image retention with flickering objects. So in some cases, if you leave something flickering in one place too long and then move it, you'll see flickering where the object is and where the object was. In this case, there's none of that. I just see the slightly flickering box. It's not flickering nearly as much as some of the other kits, but I can still see visible flickering. It's not great but it's about as good as we can expect out of these LCDs. So, so far, so good. Everything's looking pretty decent. Uh, one of the things I'm noticing is that the screen does look a little bit washed out. I don't know if that's intentional, and I don't think I like it. Uh, let's try Pokemon Emerald. I've seen this game enough times that I can just look at it and tell you offhand. It's the game I always test with, so. Yeah, it looks a little washed out. On camera, surprisingly, it looks pretty good. Oh, you know what that is? <laughs> the viewing angle. It's perfectly fine when you view it at the angle the camera's looking at it, but my angle is something like this, which is a little bit washed out, so. Take some, leave some. Unfortunately, it is not an IPS screen, and it does show.
but could be worse. It's all right. All right, time for the special feature of this kit. So, so far, everything this kit does, Funny Playing also does, except this also has some filters that I have never once used in my life. I thought, you know, at first I was thinking, hey, it'd be pretty neat to have these, you know, you could put your games in black and white, but why would you do that? I don't know, you could add a uh, weird seafoam color filter if you want, weird pink color filter, a weird yellow color filter, a weird pink, again, color filter, another sickly green color filter, and then a blue color filter. Uh, it's just, I, I've never once used these. Um, I thought at, ne at first it was kind of neat, but I just, I don't see the use case. I did a survey on Instagram a little while back. Uh, got, I think, a little over 100 answers. And over 90% of the people who answered said, yeah, they're useless, and they just cut the sensor off first thing. And I'm with you there. I think it's kind of dumb. I wish they would improve it. What I specifically asked for was a, um, I guess I wasn't using the right terminology. And maybe that's on me, but also it's Google Translate, so maybe not. Um, I wanted them to implement color accurate um, LUTs, I guess, lookup tables. Um, I usually call them filters because that's the first word that comes to my mind, and it's not specifically a filter. These, what we have, are filters. What I want are lookup tables that allow us to say, okay, this is what the color looks like on the screen if we just translate the pixel data one to one. That's fine. But we can use a lookup table to translate the pixel data from uh, what the Game Boy Advance is outputting and, uh, you know, do a little, do a little conversion uh, and mess with the colors a little bit to reproduce something that would look a little bit more authentic as if you were viewing it on the original screen. That's not the one I meant to grab, but you get my, you get, I hope you get what I'm putting down. Um, some games, like I said uh, practically an hour ago, uh, the original Game Boy Advance screen was just incredibly dark, and some games intentionally brightened up the colors to try and uh, compensate for that darkness. Well, these screens don't do any of that reverse compensation. What I want is that reverse compensation so that we get something a little bit more accurate to what the game should look like instead of what the game actually looks like. Um, there's no real wrong way to do it. Again, it is personal preference because not every game does this and the few that do a uh, even smaller subset of those games even have options you can configure in the menu to uh, compensate you know what how, how you want to compensate for which system you're playing on and so on and so forth um, those are few and far between most of them are, are extremely late releases Pokemon Emerald is not one of them anyway it would be a nice to have Unfortunately, there is not a single kit out there that is worthwhile that actually does it. Uh, there was one contender, but unfortunately it is just a pile of junk, and I do not recommend it. Uh, but if you want to know more, I have it. I have a write-up in the uh, wiki that is also linked on my site in the description. So, anyway, without further ado, let's see if they messed up the HDMI output yet again. Go ahead and plug this bad boy in here and it should automatically switch over. Oh dear. Future Mako here. Gotta go back in time and uh, kill my previous self. Uh, so usually with these types of videos, I do them out and uh, you know just let it ride, upload it and go for it. Um, but in this particular case, I have learned some information um, basically after I finished that original video and uh, before I made it public that significantly changes 
uh, the course of that video. Uh, so originally it was like an hour, 10, hour, 15 long, give or take. Um, and I'm going to stop at about 50 minutes and interject right here, and then we're going to carry on. Um, but what we're going to do, we're going to discuss one of the mistakes I made and uh, what's going on. All right, so first off, let us take the two Game Boys we have here. So the first one, of course, is the one that I just built in the uh, previous 50 minutes or so, and this other one is the old older uh, HDMI version of this kit. Now, in this particular case, uh, this Game Boy is using the HDMI board with a completely separate IPS kit, uh, also made by the same company. Um, so there are two separate, two separate bits of hardware in here. Um, if you wanted to emulate this type of build, it's going to be kind of pricey because the HDMI board itself is like 50 bucks and then the kit is going to be I actually have no idea how much this specific one costs, but I think this is the TV out version, which is going to run you over 60 bucks. Uh, so I have $110 worth of um, IPS kit in this thing. Whereas this one, I have also no idea how much it's going to run because it's not actually listed yet on uh, RGRS's site. Uh, but based off of similar kits, I'm guessing it's going to run probably around 60, 70 bucks. So cheaper option, but. Um, well, cheaper option, same company, same hardware, improvement? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, so this Game Boy, as you can see, it's working perfectly fine on the internal kit, and the batteries I have in here are my Ikea Lattes that I was running on this one. And if we go ahead and plug in my HDMI here, you can see that it's working just fine. Uh, it's picking up the capture, everything's going good. And just to get a benchmark of what this thing looked like, let me go ahead and pull up a quick full screen stripes. And you can see if you look at, if you um, make this video full screen, put it up at the full resolution, I'm recording this footage in about 1080p, uh, but it's gonna get upscaled to 4K when I export this video. Um, forgive me, but in my defense, the, the capture is, either 720p or 1080p only anyway. It's the capture is not that high quality, so I don't see the need to record in higher quality. Anyway, if you look at the lines closely, you can see some of them are sharper than others and some of them are wider than others. Uh, this specific test pattern should be displaying one row of pixels white and then one row of pixels black. You can see by the soft edges that it's not using any integer scaling for this. We can also change the pattern to a vertical one. Should be the exact same thing, just going along um, in the other direction. Uh, and then our last option is the grid, which is a combination of the two. And you can see by how blurry this thing looks that the scaling on this thing is god awful. Uh, now I'm not gonna bring out the Game Boy Color version, uh, but I will link to that video down in the description. And if you uh, skim through that video, you can see the scaling in that is a lot better, but it's also not linear. Um, it's high resolution and it's sharper, but it's not even. Um, this, at the very least, is mostly even. Um, it's fine. It's not great. Like, obviously, outside of an artificial benchmark, it looks totally fine. Like, in this menu, zero problems. But once you pull up the actual... Oop, that's not the right one. What was it? Full screen stripes. Yeah, once you pull up the actual test pattern, you can see exactly what it's doing and how not great it looks. I would also like to point out that this Game Boy, even though I have a red light on here, is working perfectly fine on the IKEA Lattas. I can unplug this, I get my screen back, you can see that test pattern, how nice and sharp it is, and you can see my power light went from red to green. It is pretty dim, but I do have a lot of lights on in here. And plug it in, switches back to red. Uh, even though the IPS kit switches off, the HDMI encoder in this thing sucks down a heap of power and it just, it, it's, it's not very battery efficient. Um, and unfortunately, this thing still runs off of batteries even when it's plugged in. Uh, so you need to pay attention to that. Uh, but anyway, that being said, I want to transition over back to the kit at hand for this video. I'm gonna go ahead and pull my batteries out and for context, these are the exact same batteries. I have not charged them. I have not 
done anything since I did the rest of the video, even though it is full next day. I even tried these batteries on the two most power hungry kits that I have on full brightness, and both of them worked perfectly fine. Uh, I even got a green light on this one. I don't remember if I got a green light on this one, but I don't really care. That's not the point. It worked. Um, anyway, let's move on to this thing. I am going to go ahead and pull out my Jugies here, drop my ladders back in, and I'm going to show you this again because it's going to get cut out of the original footage. Um, but now that I know what's going on, I think I can explain it a little bit better. I'm gonna pop in the exact same cart even, boot it up, and you see the Game Boy works perfectly fine. Got a green power light. It boots into the test suite. I will even go as far to pull up the full screen stripes, and you can see on the internal kit, looks perfectly fine exactly as we would expect. But if I were to plug this into my capture, Look and see what the Game Boy does. You see it flash in red and then it resets. Flash to red, reset, flash to red, reset, flash to red, reset. And I never get any capture on, um, or I never get any output on my capture card. If we unplug that then, the Game Boy comes back as normal. I thought this was a problem with the kit. And realistically, it is a problem with the kit, but it's not the problem I thought it was. So if we swap over to uh, some special batteries, these are Jugi batteries. Unlike these LADAs, uh, the LADAs are nickel metal hydride nominal 1.2 volt batteries. They're extremely high capacity and they work really well in most GBAs. This is not one of those GBAs. Jugis, on the other hand, have an internal lithium ion cell and a constant 1.5 volt out. Uh, charging them is a little bit complicated. You have to use the included charger or uh, find some other way to rig up a five volt input to these things. But the voltage on these things is extremely stable, even at high loads. Um, and we pop those in there. They're probably freshly charged, but it doesn't matter because until they're basically depleted, they're still gonna put out 1.5 volts. You see the GBA works perfectly fine. Uh, and let me pull up the da -da -da -da, full screen stripes and Let's see what happens when I plug it in this time. And wow, would you look at that. I have capture. And I even have a green light. So what's going on with this thing is um, this the HDMI encoder in this specific chip in this specific kit is just significantly more power hungry than the old version they used. I don't know what's going on, but looking at the capture footage, I can guess to me. Uh, so since the scaling on this test pattern is even more even than on the older version uh, and a little bit smoother, I can tell that it is doing a little bit more upscaling and maybe that's why it's taking a little bit more power. That being said, I think it's taking an, 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 ooh, an unacceptable amount of power because if it doesn't work on LADAs, uh, then I don't know what good it is. Like, why, why do you need special batteries for this kit? Realistically, this is, like, if you're gonna be playing it tethered to a TV, you shouldn't need special batteries too. Like, that just adds to the cost of the kit. So remember in the beginning when I said this was about $110 worth of IPS hardware, and this is probably about $70 worth of IPS hardware? Well, one of the solutions to this problem is a battery mod like this. These are about 40 bucks. 40 plus 70, 110. So, it's not great. Uh, if you want to go the route I chose and use Jugies instead of um, like a battery mod, uh, because generally these work a little bit better uh, and not to mention they work in other devices too. Uh, these come in a four pack, so you can keep one on the charger and then just swap them out whenever you get them. But this is like 35 to 40 bucks as well. So you're, you're still looking at like about $110 purchase for something like this. Uh, and even then it's still running off batteries. In the case of this battery mod, the one from Retromodding in particular, 
uh, is actually a really nice design because it includes um, full load shifting. Uh, so if you plug it into charge, it's going to run the GBA off of the input power instead of off of the battery, which means the battery can charge safely. That is a very, very important thing because a lot of other battery mods do not include this sort of feature. So if you're using something like this, or even that $25 one that Retro Game Repair Shop sells, sorry RGRS, um, you can't play and charge that simultaneously. It'll work and it'll solve this problem, but you still have to turn the GBA off or fully remove the mod to charge it. Um, so in the case of this specific mod, I think this is like the only battery solution you should look into um, if you don't already have something like Jukies. That being said, let's move on, let's, let's evaluate the kit, let's see what's going on. So back to the test pattern here, I can see, like I said, compared to the old one, it's quite a bit sharper and looks a little bit more even to my eye. And if we switch to the vertical pattern, I'm seeing pretty much the same thing that I saw with the horizontal. And then with the grid, it looks much, much sharper. So overall, compared to the old version of the kit, I think this is better, if only for the quality of the HDMI output. I'm pretty pleased with that. And again, in the menu, it looks perfectly fine. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where things stop being good. Um, if we go into the grid, you can see that there is some overscan there. So if your TV has like cut cutoffs at the edges, uh, it's not gonna cut off any of your screen. Uh, but unfortunately, it means if you have a proper TV that does not cut off at the edges, you're just going to have pillar boxing and letter boxing at all times. Uh, I know some TVs allow you to adjust this and you can compensate for it, but mine doesn't. Um, but that's probably more a testament to my specific TV because it's about um, 15 years old, I think. It's an older one, it's only 720p. Anyway, moving on. Uh, my capture card does not allow this sort of functionality, but if I wanted to, I could always just go into OBS and uh, zoom it if I wanted to. Um, but generally, I wouldn't be playing through OBS. Uh, my capture card has a pass-through. I would be using that pass-through to play it. I got a new capture card, by the way. This one's so much better than the old piece of junk I was using. Um, if you see these around on the internet, they're pretty good for the 10 bucks they cost, but um, if you want to actually play through it, it's not great. <laughs> also, 720p60 or 1080 30, that's all you get out of these. Um, this new one does 4K, but that's besides the point. If we go into the linearity test, uh, what this kit does is it, or what this test image does is it draws five circles and, um, well, it's supposed to draw five circles. If you get five ellipses, then you can tell your kit is running or your uh, image is running at the wrong aspect ratio. And if you can't tell by looking at it, those are definitely ellipses. It's running at the wrong aspect ratio. Granted, it's not that bad, but it is still less than ideal, I think. Um, other than that, I don't have too many complaints. Um, you can see the shadow sprite test totally crashes the thing. It's not great. Uh, but you can also see the flickering, and this is more a testament to modern screens, and I don't know that there's a really good workaround for something like this uh, over HDMI. Uh, this, this is more to do with um, specific features on your TV. Uh, I don't know that frame blending is a thing that TVs do, but if it is, you'd probably want to turn it on for your Game Boy Advance. Why is it black and white? Did I hit the touch sensor? I did. Okay. But of course, we're not going to get any real um, burn-in or static images here, because again, that depends on the specific display you're using, and in my case, my capture footage isn't going to burn in. and. I have it plugged into a pretty decent display that doesn't have issues like that. Um, quite frankly, I don't think computer displays have had issues like that in like 20 years. Anyway, moving on. 
So let us do a few more tests. So far, it's all right. I'm gonna go ahead and plug in Pokemon Emerald here. Just run through real quick. And uh, this way you can actually hear the audio. I have the audio coming out of the GBA and through the capture. I'm gonna go ahead and mute the GBA so you can, so you don't get that weird echo. I'm gonna overlay the footage. I have my volume down on my computer itself. I can hear it. I don't think the camera's capturing it. Hopefully the capture audio is still pretty decent. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't think to check that beforehand. Um, it doesn't look very smooth to me. That could be my capture, and it could be because I'm recording. So review the footage and, and judge it for yourself. It's playable. It's definitely playable. It's not great from here, though. Um, but granted, like I said, I'll review the footage in post, and um, if I'm full of crap, then, uh, well, you guys will know, because you'll see the footage as it's captured, not as I'm seeing it. The audio itself, like I said, it's a little quiet. It sounds perfectly fine to me. Uh, unless I do... Uh, some artificial tests. I don't think I'd be able to tell left from right audio if my audio is reversed uh, But that is what this test cart would be good for uh, that AGS aging ROM that I was using before and that I've used so many times frequently Not the AGS aging ROM. 240p test suite. I'm sorry uh, 240p test suite has some audio tests in here that I typically don't use because we typically don't care about audio um, mostly because I personally don't really care about the audio, but also these kits very rarely even affect the audio whatsoever. Um, picture quality itself, aside from the wonky aspect ratio, it's fine. Like I don't, I don't see anything weird with the colors. Um, like I said, it is a little stuttery, but that could just be my capture. Honestly, I don't know. I'll have to review the footage afterwards. Uh, but let's move on again. I am going to grab. Da, 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 da. Oh, right here. Getting ahead of myself. The EverDrive. And let's run through our standard array of tests. Oh, that's not great, is it? Come on. You can do it. You can do it. I don't think it's going to do it. Let's reseed it, make sure it's not that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to do it. Ascent? No? Maybe? Alright, so if that doesn't work, the easy flash almost definitely won't work, but let's try it anyway. Based on that flashing, I think we're even worse off. Ah! Wait! Oh, mm -hmm. Alright, plan B. I'm gonna go back to the EverDrive, but I'm gonna unplug it. It should boot up fine with the uh, HDMI encoder powered off. And indeed it does. And I bet we can boot into my test and then plug it back in and it should work. Yeah, and indeed it does. Uh, so same spiel as usual. We're just checking to see if there's any frame dropping, stuttering, tearing, any of the sort. When the S in the word scrolling passes the left-hand side of the screen, it's issuing an LCD reset command, which the HDMI encoder portion of this IPS kit does seem to be handling properly. Uh, so it is gonna drop a frame. That is the normal operation and that is the desired result. Uh, so passes this test with flying colors. Let us... Uh, Reboot it, back to menu, 
And let's try... What do we want? Legend of Zelda, I think it is. Yeah. And we do have the uh, normal GBA controls if you want to make it look horrible. But, same deal as usual. It's the exact same thing as that Shadow Sprite test, and it handles it pretty much how I expect. You see the flickering, uh, but you don't see any weird artifacts. And then, same thing with the uh, wood posts on the grass. Um, on some of the older kits, there was some artifacting, but that was a result of the LCD technology used with the display itself. Whoops, I'm hitting things. Um, so, that test I can't really run here, and even if I did, the results would be pretty much useful for my use case only because of the specific screen I have it displayed on. Uh, but if this looks a little wonky on your screen, then um, get your display looked at, I guess. But yeah, it's fine. It's all right. I don't hate it. Let's try the Easy Flash now with that same method. I think it should work. If I boot it with the HDMI encoder switched off and then plug it in. Let's just try Pokemon Silva. Come on. There it goes. Yeah, and it works. So that's not great, but realistically I don't know that it's a huge problem. I was going to the party to fly to the um, to Evergrande City, which doesn't exist in this game because it's not Pokemon Emerald. But yeah, it's all right. Um, unfortunately, I can't test the input lag, but realistically, it doesn't seem too bad to me. Um, we can do a pseudo test. The uh, Super Mario Bros. And bonus, we can see if there are any weird artifacting in this game because this does have some weird artifacting in IPS kits, and ooh, you can see it bad here. Uh, but this just goes to show you what the devs did to the game that causes it to have the uh, the weird effects that it does. Um, that's just how they scaled it. They, I, I think I've explained this before, but for those that don't know, this game is a port of the original Nintendo Entertainment System. Um, to, to my knowledge, my understanding, uh, the devs did have access to the original source code, but it was also easier to just run the game as is and then scale it rather than redraw all of the objects on the screen. Uh, granted, the difference in vertical height between the original Nintendo Entertainment System and the GBA is pretty minimal. Did it just turn off when I tapped it? Oh, no, just went back to the menu. Um, so, on a normal GBA screen, that is to say the OEM one, the stock one, it's fine. You don't notice this thing. The stock screen hides these defects pretty well. Uh, unfortunately, IPS kits um, like I said, some of them are particularly sensitive to flashing elements on the screen, and this game is certainly no exception, and this causes artifacts out the wazoo with those kits. Uh, so I'm gonna try and go through a level real quick. And the whole purpose of this is not to show how horrible this game looks, but to try and judge the input lag. I am used to playing these sort of games with input lag, so it's not too good of an indicator, but I suppose it's better than nothing. Barring the uh, proper test. Oh. Oh no! Ah. Yeah, I'm sure there's input lag, but 
it's no big deal. It's perfectly playable, even through my capture card. I'm sure it'd be even better through the pass-through. But, all right, so, yeah, there you go. Um, I think that's gonna go ahead and conclude this video here. Uh, I will go ahead and get this spliced into my original footage and get the capture footage overlaid so that uh, rather than me just uploading this standalone, it makes a little bit more sense. Um, but also so that all of the um, speculation I did in the second half of that video is not, um, you know, going to set anyone down the wrong path. I'm a big stickler for uh, admitting when one is wrong, and, um, I was wrong. But, not for, uh, not for any fault of my own. <laughs> Oop. And there you go. Perfect note to end the, uh, capture on. I'm gonna go ahead and kill that. So, yeah. Let us... Let us sum up the things I discussed yesterday, um, just because I usually sum that sort of stuff up at the end of the video. Oh my god, those are warm. Those should not be warm. <laughs> that is not great. I... Okay, hang on. We, we gotta do one more thing. I was gonna end it here, but now I gotta know. Is this the most power inefficient kit that I own when you're using HDMI. I am going to... Oh, you know what? Let me set this to... Come on. Three volt. Oh, and I better up the... Um... power limit. Power limit is set at 1.75 amps and unfortunately I haven't made a jig for this yet. I will. Um, I usually just pop the rear housing off and then I can clip that on but I'm just gonna try and hold it. Oh, Helps if you switch the uh, power supply on, huh? Alright, so plugging this in Normal operation, things pull in at three volts, mind you, so these numbers aren't directly com comparable with the numbers I gave you earlier. Uh, at three volts, it's pulling just under 300 milliamps, uh, and if you do the math on that, it's just about 0.8 watts, which is pretty darn high for a GBA, but it's not the worst I've seen. But if we plug in the HDMI, it doubles the power consumption to almost, no, to over two watts. We're pulling, I saw a peak of like 2.1 watts, which is absolutely absurd. This is, that is way too much for a handheld. Um, it's, it's really not great. I blasted another kit recently for pulling numbers that, that were shy of this. Um, this deserves the exact same treatment. For comparison, I'm gonna unplug that, power that off, and we're gonna check what the other one does in the same game. And of course, this is the old HDMI kit. Oh, no, I want to see without first. All right, and so without the HDMI, it's pulling basically the same, just under 0.8 watts, um, but it's a little bit, it's like 20 milliamps lower, but that could just be the difference in brightness. I don't know which was set where. But if we plug in HDMI, you can see it does jump up there, but not nearly as much as the other one. This one's pulling 1 1.2 watts, I saw a peak, which is significantly lower than the 1.8 watts. And 
fun fact, um, or bonus fact, I guess, uh, since we already covered this, uh, you can see the flickering on this one too. It's a little bit worse, actually. I think that's a factor of scaling, but that just, or a factor of the scaling, uh, given that this thing does not scale the same as this one. But the power usage is significantly lower. Granted, it's still over a watt, and that's absurd for a GBA, but... Hey, there you go. Get that unplugged. Get that switched off. So, there we go. There's the new um, DSi HDMI GBA kit. <laughs> Uh, DSi because, like I said earlier, it uses that DSi screen, HDMI because HDMI, uh, and it's for a GBA. Um, I don't, I don't think this is the way. Like, if you, okay, let me let me qualify that. If you want a GBA that has a pretty decent backlight, the all-around best runner-up, I guess. Um, nah, that's that's not the right phrasing. That's for what I want to say. In my opinion, the best all-around GBA backlight kit right now is the ITA kit from Funny Playing. One chip, the company that made this kit, must have been paying attention because they decided to copy that um, in the best way they could by using literally the same screen uh, but with their conversion instead. The funny playing implementation is quite a bit more polished, much lower power. Um, you don't have those worthless uh, filters. Uh, and if you need to, you can move the image on the screen a little bit, you know, in case your alignment's a little bit off, uh, you're not using one of the funny playing shells, so on and so forth, whatever, you name it. I think this is better. And since the kit itself is like 35, 40 bucks, it's really hard to beat in terms of price. Uh, so on average, the video quality or the LCD quality of the Funny Playing Kit, I think has more pros um, and fewer cons than any other kit out there right this second. They tried to capitalize on that by implementing just about the same thing, except the power usage is just so much worse that as a standalone kit, there's no point. You would only be getting something like this, in my opinion, if you wanted the HDMI out. There's there's no reason to go for this over this if you don't care about HDMI. It's twice the price, significantly more difficult to install, half the battery life. There's no argument. The only argument is HDMI. The HDMI, admittedly, now that I know that it draws an absurd amount of power, two frickin' watts, um, it's all right. It is way better than all of their previous implementations of HDMI, but I really wish they would just get the aspect ratio right. It's not that difficult, and they even did it on the Game Boy Color. We asked them about it. You know what they said? Can't be done. You know what I said? That's bullshit because you did it on the Game Boy Color. We stopped talking at that point. Um, granted. I should qualify that. I was not talking with them directly. I was talking through an intermediary and I told my intermediary that's bullshit and I don't think he relayed that. And uh, good for him because I don't, I didn't mean that to be relayed. That was more a comment on what they're saying. But it is what it is. Um, I still think the kit can be better. And quite frankly, I'm tired of them putting out this kind of hardware where it's just so close to being good. It's just so close. There's just one little thing, or in this case, one really big thing um, staring you right in the face. <sighs> if you can get over the power usage, that is to say, if you're using like one of these battery mods, it's probably fine. If having a GBA HDMI solution like genuinely appeals to you and you don't care for it being portable, there are much 
better options. Uh, Gamebox makes the GBA HD Advance Consolizer kit, uh, and they sell it as a pre-made, like, assembled thing. You just buy it, plug it in, put your game in, play. Uh, but they also sell a kit if you want to do that, and you can add your own GBA, build it yourself. Pretty neat thing. I personally don't have one, and I have not tried one out, but I understand the, um, the work that goes into it, and I've seen firsthand how it looks, and it is much better than this. Uh, also, added bonus, you don't have to worry about batteries. You just plug it in and it just works. Um, also, you got the controller support. You don't have to play on the GBA itself, which could be a pro or a con depending on who you talk to. In my opinion, I think it's a little bit of a pro uh, because if you're waving this thing around, you know, you have it attached by that itty bitty cable. I don't know about you guys, but HDMI is pretty thick. I don't think this thing is meant to be waved around. I think this connector is designed to be plugged in and left alone. That being said, of course, they thought of that. They make a dock for this thing. Maybe we'll check it out at some point in the future, but I don't expect it to, I don't expect it to improve my opinion on this thing. So on that note, I think I gotta call this one and uh, end it here because this is, this is a pretty long, um, reshoot and I'm editing it into the video pretty darn late into that already long video so I'm sorry this one's gonna be a long one and if you stuck with it so far um, you're a saint and thank you um, if not well you're not listening to me anyway but I appreciate you sticking with me as much as you did anyway um, that's it for this uh, I usually do these sort of videos uh in my opinion it's more of like a first look at this thing it's not exactly a review or a guide uh but you can certainly use it as such if you want after these videos i tend to organize my thoughts play with it a little bit more think about think about you know distill it down to the the most important pros and most important cons and then i throw that in the wiki that i maintain I have a write-up on every single kit that I have ever had cross my bench, and even a few that I have not, um, though those ones are few and far between, and can't really get them anymore, so it's kind of less relevant. I'm not really going to worry about going back and, and uh, fixing those specific items. Uh, but in the case of the wiki, I think that's a little bit more polished uh, thought stream. It's certainly a lot easier to digest than a darn near two-hour video, since it's usually only like three or four sentences. You know, it takes takes you 30 seconds to read. It takes you longer to get to the site and find the specific entry you want than it does to read my thoughts on it. But either way, I already know they aren't going to be positive. I don't think this is the kit. But that being said, it does appeal to a specific niche, and if that niche is uh, something you were looking for, then I guess this is your option. I hope it works out for you. Um, and on that note, I think I gotta end it here. I'm probably cutting this part out, so I'll say it again. Um, big shout out to Retro Game Repair Shop for sending me this sort of stuff to uh, check out. Um, they don't review these videos before I upload them. They don't give me an agenda they don't they don't tell me hey I need you to sell this kit they give me the kit and they say I want your honest thoughts on it and I give them my honest thoughts and if they sell the kit I'll point you in their direction and if they don't sell the kit it's usually because I told them it was a piece of garbage uh, in this particular case I believe they bought a few already and they're gonna be listed I don't know how long um, but as soon as the listing goes up, I will go ahead and throw it in the description if you want to check it out. Uh, but like I said, it's a very specific niche, and if you're in that niche, then more power to you. I hope it works, but I think we can do better. We'll just have to wait for the next iteration uh, that one chip releases that fixes this one issue and introduces yet another one. Um, yeah, I think that's all I've got. Check out the description for links. Um, 
got the store link, got my wiki link, or I got my personal site link there, which has a link to my wiki. Um, got some links to the other videos. I suppose I'll link you to the ITA video if you want to check that out. Much better kit in my opinion, unless you need that HDMI out, which this one doesn't have, but I don't think it really needs. Um, and because I'm sure someone's going to ask, this is the C screen or C LCD. Uh, I will link to that in the description. This is the clean juice, uh, not clean juice, excuse me, clean screen. I will also link to that video in the description. I didn't like either of these and for the most part it came down to power usage and I don't want to talk about it. That's what the other videos are for. <laughs> but funny, funny how those came up, you know, we've got, we've got three with the uh, horrifying power usage here, but yeah, that's all I've got. Thanks for sticking with me, and uh, we'll catch you all next time.